Daniel S. asked a question. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13, uh, sure. verse 1 through 4 and 1 through 5, is that is that possibly a warning about um, ideological theologies like Christianity and others as well? I don't have a clue what Jesus actually said. He, As it turns out, he didn't write anything, or if he did, it did not. Uh, no one copied it over. So we don't have anything that Jesus wrote. So we don't have a clue what Jesus actually said. It, it, but Deuteronomy 13, uh, just by, for those who are not familiar with this chapter, deals with um, the, the enticer among your people. Uh, a Jew among your people, the son of your mother, means among your brethren, who will entice you to um, call you to follow other gods that you did not know, to not keep the commandments, the law is over, you don't have to keep the commandments anymore. Uh, this person is not coming in the name of God, even if he will perform miracles and wonders and signs. That's how Deuteronomy 13 begins. Uh, it says if a, if a, if a prophet, because of, even though they're false prophets, the term false prophet is really not used in the Torah, it just calls him a prophet. Uh, a dreamer of dreams says, you know, shows you a sign of wonder, and, and, the, and the sign of the wonder, the miracle happens. The person is able to produce miracles, or is able to predict the future accurately. And then the person says, follow other gods, their father didn't know, or don't keep the commandments. Or, the Torah says, do not listen to that prophet or dreamer of dreams. I did not send him, saith the Lord. The question, of course, comes to mind is, well, why would God allow false prophets and false religions to produce spiritual um, experiences? Uh, why would people in every religion encounter a, a numinous experience? Why? Why would, well, God tells us there, and that is, I am only testing you to see if you love me. And then, that's it, just a test. So if if, let's say, I met uh, a Zoroastrian who was able to make dead people come alive, I still wouldn't convert. If a Hindu, in the name of the monkey god, you know, started talking in tongues, I would not become a Hindu. It wouldn't make a difference. It has to, the, the message of the Torah um, m must be upheld by every prophet. No prophet added an extra commandment or took away a commandment. And any person who says that the commandments were temporary, or there is that person is lying. And then the Torah does instruct us what to do with such a person. That person is worthy of the death penalty. Now, the question is, does the, is that the Torah warning us about Jesus? Well, as it turns out, we don't know what Jesus said, because if I believe that the Christian Bible was an accurate record of Jesus, I'd be a Christian. So I really have no clue. And the New Testament itself does not agree what Jesus said, when he said it, how he said it. I'm not trying to speak scoff at the Christian Bible. It's just the Christian Bible is vulnerable to ridicule because it makes fantastic claims. And fantastic claims do require at least some evidence, which the Christian Bible does not provide. Uh, so we don't, I don't know what Jesus really said. It's possible he never claimed to be the Messiah and that claim was made for him. I happen to believe that for a variety of reasons which I'm not going to go into. But if Jesus or Paul, well Paul certainly went around saying it. Paul definitely said that one should not keep the commandments. And don't write me and say, I misunderstand Paul. If you're a Christian and you think I'm wrong, you misunderstood Paul. Because, and as it turns out, if you're not sure, every Christian church father and every reformer and all the people, if you're a Christian pastor that you studied in seminary, all believe that. They all did. So this is not uh, Rabbi Tovia Singer trying to portray Paul in a way that is demeaning. In fact, this is, and this is because Paul is very clear about this. Paul very much taught that that one should not keep the commandments. That means to Paul, it's not 
just keeping commandments didn't do anything, it was just irrelevant. It was actually harmful to keep commandments because that means if you kept the law, that means that you're saying that Jesus' uh, human sacrifice, Calvary, is irrelevant. And he was a fierce opponent of Torah observance. Uh, he had a lot of enemies. We see that in all of his letters. We know he had enemies who thought that Paul was a fraud and was condemned for saying this. But Paul won, and Paul's version of Christianity uh, ultimately was the, the version that was adopted by the church. And the other understandings of Christianity, for example, early movement, Christian movements like the Abionites, they lost, they were crushed, and they're gone. So Paul's idea of Christianity was very successful. Uh, the author of Acts is quite responsible for Paul's success in a variety of historical reasons. It was a, so of course that this would apply. The, but I can't tell you, this is talking about Jesus specifically, but if Jesus subscribed to this idea that he was God, I don't believe that Jesus ever claimed to be God. I am sure that's a later Christian invention because it's not found in the Christian Bible. And it's, it's, and the, the earlier the books are, the, more, the less likely is you'll find a verse that even could be construed as saying that Jesus was a deity. Um, the notion that uh, the, one doesn't have to keep the commandments anymore, well, we can find an, kind of an allusion to that in the gospel, really not a lot. This is very Pauline. This is really not an idea advanced very much in the gospels. In fact, in the gospels, there's just not a whole lot of theology at all. It's a lot of storytelling. Now, I know you could point to Mark 7.20, but again, the Gospels were not interested in, in conveying theology. Paul is responsible for, the, for what Christians, the doctrines that Christians believe. You won't find that. You won't find much doctrinal teachings in the Gospels. And in fact, you'll find many uh, stories or parables in the Gospels that, are completely, that convey the opposite notion. Uh, I know you're thinking I'm going to say Matthew 5, 17, and 18. Well, I'm not. I'm not going into why, but it's, people think, like Jesus said, you know, you have to keep the law and you want to change the law. There's a different reason why that's in the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew. It's misunderstood. But if you really want to see a text that, see, that points to an understanding of Jesus' message that is very different than Paul's, you would look to the parable of the sheep and the goats. Uh, you can find that in the book of Matthew. That's an M source. That is saying clearly that the way you are righteous is by how you behave towards other people. If you behave right, you're going to go to heaven. If you behave badly, not believe in Jesus, but how you treat other people, that, you know, that will, will save you. That is a, that little parable, uh, that little parable, the sheep and the goats, happens, it may it may be a what's called a pre-literary source. It may be. Pre-literary source may... People are going, what does a pre-literary source mean? A pre-literary source is, is there anything in the Christian Bible that we see in the Christian Bible that's actually older than the text? Meaning... Matthew was written, the book of Matthew was written by somebody, a highly literate Christian, a Greek-speaking Christian at the end of the first century. We don't know where it was written. We don't know who wrote it. Okay, Let's forget Catholic tradition. We just have no clue. But the question is, and if those of you who studied, who took, particularly at the graduate level, you'll take uh, courses like hymns and creeds in the New Testament. Uh, me, what Christian scholars are interested in is, is there anything in the letters of Paul that were not written by Paul, but actually predate Paul, that Paul was repeating over? Because the, the Jesus, let's say, crucified in the year 30, and let's say 1 Thessalonians is written about the year 50, so we don't have anything older than 50. So Everybody, all the Christian scholars, Jews are really not interested in this at all. Like, we could care less, like, was it when the Bhagavad Gita was written, like, is it, well, we don't, it's not relevant to us. We're just, what, what's relevant is what Christians are 
proposing today. But to Christian scholars, they're very curious, is, is there anything in Matthew that's really much older and is, really comes from the year 40? Or maybe comes from the time, from the li- from the time that Jesus was alive? That's called, so, so for instance, um, the, um, the hymn of Christ, the, um, in Philippians 2, uh, it's called the hymn of Christ, uh, um, uh, called the Carmen Christi. Is that older than, than uh, the book of Philippians? Okay, I'm not going to go into why, yes or no, but this is very. This is a very curious topic. Are there, we find in Acts 13, are there passages that we could say are older than the book? They weren't invented at the time of Matthew, but actually earlier. Well, maybe this does go back to an earlier stage of Christianity where the idea of vicarious atonement didn't exist and was, would horrify a Christian. Maybe, maybe not. I have no clue. And frankly, it's not important to me. If you're, those of you listening to the show who, who went to Christian seminary and you took graduate courses, you'd be learning about pre-literary sources. So, so going back, there's almost no theology in the gospel. There's a lot of it in the writings of Paul. We have no clue what Jesus actually said. And it's pretty, it's obvious to me, given the, what's called the doubting passages in the Christian Bible, where people just seem, in the New Testament, it is, it is claimed that people really didn't know who Jesus was, they didn't know what his job was, and what role was he supposed to fill. We find that explicitly in the New Testament on numerous occasions when people go, I just don't know who you are. Those kinds of passages are very striking because how do they make it into the Christian text and why would, uh, the, how would that creep into Christian tradition? It's possible that, in fact, people didn't know who he was and that assignment of being a Messiah and so on is a, is a, a much later development and that's why he crept into Matthew 16. We're now, in, we're now moving into some speculation, but there's a reason for it. There is a rigorous criteria that we're using because this is a little embarrassing. So it was unlikely this stuff would have, that someone would have invented later that people really did not have a clue who Jesus was during his ministry. It's unlikely that someone would have invented that, and therefore it's more likely that people really weren't sure who he was, and and what we know today as Christianity was all developed after, if Jesus was crucified, which is quite possible, hundreds of thousands of Jews were, that this all was developed later. But the question has been asked by scholars, if you put whoever wrote Matthew, if you put him in a room with Paul, would only one guy come out alive? Would one guy walk out with a black eye? You know, that, you know, in, in seminary, that you know, especially liberal, you may you won't get that question at Fuller Theological Seminary or at Moody. Those are fundamentalist places. They don't talk this. They don't teach this way. But if you go to uh, Duke University Seminary, Methodist Seminary, they will teach this. Mm-hmm.